Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, so let me start here with the welcome note. Um, so welcome to the ninth talk of the 2023 invited seminar series organized by the IEEE Computer Society, San Diego chapter. I am Parag Thadesa and I chair the Electronics Packaging Society chapter in San Diego. It is a pleasure of our chapter to co-host uh, today's talk of Dr. Omar Shehab, along with the IEEE Young Professional uh, San Diego chapter. As a note, the talk will be recorded and shared for later viewing. Uh, about uh, our speaker's bio, uh, he is a staff research scientist at the Theory, Algorithm and Applications team of IBM Quantum based in IBM TJ Watson Research Center, New York. He obtained his PhD on quantum complexity theory from UMBC in 2016. He focuses on quantum algorithms for natural science simulation, quantum optimization, and machine learning. He is also PIs in the DARPA quantum benchmarking program and welcome Leaf Q4 bio program. With that, uh, I give the floor to our speaker. Please go ahead, Dr. Shah. Um, thank you, Parag, for the kind introduction. Um, hello, everyone. I hope everyone uh, hears me properly uh, and uh, is able to um, see the screen. Um, all right, so I, um, I'm really excited uh, to give the talk today. Um, um, very uh, a few times I get a chance to interact uh, with um, uh, people who are actually outside quantum computing, so I'm really excited to uh, learn from your questions too. Yes, go ahead. Was there a question? Okay, yeah. Probably not, yeah, let's go uh, ahead. Okay, yeah, so um, you, you might have noticed that uh, I changed the title a little bit. Instead of chat GPT, I said LLMs, just to make sure that our lawyers are not yelling at me for endorsing a particular product, which is not IBM's product. Um, yeah, uh, so um, um, my name, as, as Prague has said, um, I'm uh, Omar Shehab. Um, I'm a, a research scientist at IBM Quantum Theory Team uh, based in uh, TJ Watson Research Center. Um, so uh, also, um, just as the Curtis, I would love to acknowledge um, uh, my uh, uh, sp sponsors of research. Um, although uh, uh, this talk is a mostly a colloquium talk, so I will not be focusing uh, on any particular research result it will i will try to stay at a higher level um, uh, but i'm happy to uh, answer to any specific questions so um, the general outline is uh, as follows um, um, uh, I, I will start with a very basic introduction uh, uh, to quantum computing what uh, what is the the there is no voice please huh uh -huh. Uh, no, I can hear you. Okay. okay. All right. We can all hear you. you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I will briefly dis uh, um, tell uh, what is what what quantum computing is. Um, I will also okay. Um, I, I will also um, uh, kind of since since this uh, uh, this is not exactly a quantum computing community, I will kind of give you like a visual uh, overview of what these systems look like. What are the important historical developments? And I kind of um, taking a leap of faith that lots of people in this community are work, working in machine learning. So I thought I will get it to that test uh, by explaining how we think about quantum machine learning. And then I will talk a little bit about what the practical challenges of building these systems. And also um, quick housekeeping. Um, this is, a, uh, I will try to stay at a, uh, um, at a very informal level, so feel free to stop me at any time, ask any question you like. All right, so um, let's see. I see there is an annotation um, dialogue which is not letting me, okay, now I, I believe now I can move. Okay, okay, so what, do you, what is quantum computing? So quantum computing is a new model of computing. It was proposed by Richard Feynman in mid 80s. Um, and interestingly, the conference uh, where he first started talking about this was co-hosted by IBM along with MIT in uh, early 80s. Um, so in early 80s, he wrote a, a series of three papers. 
Um, so there was this paper called uh, There is Plenty of Room at the Bottom, which basically, in a sense, gave birth to nanotechnologies. Then there were two papers um, um, in 80s, which are simulating physics uh, 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 with computers and uh, quantum mechanical computers. So these two papers basically created the foundation of this new computational model. Um, so in the last paper, quantum mechanical computer, he basically showed that um, since any computer should have a clock, internal clock, he showed how one can create a clock using a quantum mechanical Hamiltonian and how you can use that clock to keep track of basic computational step or logical steps. So that, that was the first paper which established quantum, uh, a, quant a computational model based on uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, the difference between our traditional computational model and quantum mechanical computational model is that the, the foundation of our uh, traditional or classical computing is uh, binary arithmetic. So there is no physical element to it. It's just you know, mathematics. On the other side, uh, quantum computing is based on quantum mechanics, so which is a physical model. So these are this is these are the two. Uh, this is the main difference between the, uh, these two computational models. So when you uh, develop or construct a computational model based on the principles of quantum mechanics, you naturally inherit some phenomena from quantum mechanics, and they actually play a role in computation. So for example, quantum superposition, which means that you can actually have multiple logical state in superposition on, on a quantum system. It has implications um, in computing because maybe uh, in some cases you can actually uh, give multiple input to your algorithm in a superposition. This is an example. Another quantum mechanical phenomena could be quantum entanglement. So what is the implication in computing? You can, so quantum entanglement is a, a statistical observation you can see in the lab, you can make in the lab, and there is no way you can explain those statistical observations. And I can be specific, it is a very specific type of correlation among different quantum properties. There is no way you can explain that using Newtonian mechanics. So it's a purely quantum phenomena, you can see, observe it in the lab, and um, it plays a role in computing because in some alg quantum algorithms, if you create that special correlation, it, you can take advantage of it, which means that you can use that as a resource, and that actually gives you a certain advantage. Um, so in today's uh, talk, I will not be talking about a specific algorithm, so I will probably not give any example, but there are such algorithms where because of the entanglement, you can get some speed up. And finally, quantum measurement. Um, quantum measurement is probabilistic, which means that if you are running a quantum experiment in the lab, you have to run it uh, like hundreds of thousands of times and create a probabilistic distribution. And in your computing, you, uh, any result of the computing has to be uh, input from that distribution. It has some uh, um, similarity with machine learning because in machine learning, you have to run number of shards we actually use the same term, shards, um, uh, uh, when we run quantum experiments in the lab. So there are other things I would like to mention before going into the details. Um, contrary to what you see sometimes in popular media or like in sci-fi movies, quantum computing is not a silver bullet for all hard problems. So which means that once we have uh, production grade scalable quantum system, there will still be plenty of problem which is beyond the reach of those systems. Um, thus, architecture is non von Neumann architecture, so which means that you will not have this um, conceptual separation among like data processing and uh, uh, communication, or, or also input output, which also means that the programming model of these computers is also going to be slightly different. Uh, when you uh, encode information in uh, 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 in a quantum computer. The data is encoded in qubits, 
the mathematical space of those qubits is Hilbert space, which is a special type of complex vector space. So that's different from classical computer, which is basically binary uh, bit strings, like right? the data is basically bit strings or vectors of bit string. So since um, the data is encoded in a uh, complex vector space, naturally uh, you expect the logical operations to be some kind of matrix, and it is. Uh, uh, the logical operations are complex unitary matrices. And as I mentioned, uh, quantum mechanics is probabilistic. This is because of, uh, this comes from Schrodinger's equation. So when you run an experiment, the readout is probabilistic as I have mentioned before. And there is, there is a cultural uh, uh, thing, which is basically, uh, since the industry is primitive, most of the time the community is working on toy problems or s simple enough problems that you will see the algorithms ex expressed as visual manner. And we said that those are quantum circuits, but those are basically visual representation of uh, traditional quantum algorithm. Um, all right. So, um, so these are like I wanted to again. Uh, I didn't give you like a rigorous um, mathematically sound introduction, but I wanted to give you an overview at to um, so that you, you to set certain expectation. Um, before going into more details about like how we find problems um, uh, for quantum computing, I would like to give you like a visual tour of what these systems look like. So, um, and before I start with those, I, I should mention that there are actually several technologies people are trying for quantum computers. So, and this is more diverse than uh, classical computing, which is basically CMOS based technology in most cases. So this diversity indicates that um, uh, the technology is still um, um, in its early stage. We still do not know which one is the best technology. And we might end up in a situation where for a different technology might turn out to be uh, optimal for different app use cases. So there are superconducting qubits, which is basically what IBM, Google, and Amazon is trying. There is strapped down qubits, um, mostly used by um, um, IMQ, Alpine quantum computing, and there are a few others. There are also silicon quantum dots used by um, um, Intel, uh, topological qubits uh, developed, being developed by Microsoft. There are also di uh, diamond vacancy-based systems. There are different technologies, and they have their pros and cons. Um, IBM uses superconducting qubit quantum computers, so that's why that that's what I will be covering uh, today. So um, I I I, I, um, I deliberately um, 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 I'm deliberately showing two chips, one from 2015 and one from one from 2020, which is last year, so very recent. So. Um, I've been, IBM uh, uh, has been uh, uh, working on quantum computing for a while, for decades, um, starting from like all the way back you know, from Launders principle, right, of computing. Uh, however, IBM announced their first quantum computer in 2015. So on the left-hand side, you see that chip, which we uh, um, use for our uh, public announcement. On the right hand side, that's our latest chip we announced last year. We we typically announce new chips like um, like every winter, um, and the sheer progress between uh, 2015 and 22 is actually very obvious here. On 2015, it's mostly like handcrafted stuff, and on 2022, it is like um, manufactured in uh, like um, at an industrial grade. So uh, and this, this progress, although it is visually obvious for chips, is actually happening everywhere in, in hardware, in algorithms, um, in ecosystem developments, in industry adoptions, like in any aspect, you will see that the progress is uh, staggering. Um, so maybe we can take a look at the ch uh, chip a little, little closer so that we can understand what are the functional elements of that chip. Um, again, I'm not a, uh, I'm a theorist, I'm not a hardware guy, so um, 
I know only enough to be dangerous, but I will try to uh, say something uh, useful. Um, so, so, so when we developed uh, develop um, superconducting qubits, which is basically a unit of quantum uh, computing, we basically um, uh, fabricate uh, loops, super uh, loops where current can flow. Um, uh, at, um, when the uh, loop is converted, it, it becomes a superconductor. Uh, so that's what you're looking at. I don't know if you're able to see my mouse pointer. So, so, so this is the region. Uh, there is a region in the chip, uh, so which is basically superconducting qubit. That's basically the loop. Um, until like I think um, 20, um, 2021, we used to disclose the metal or. Uh, we 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 are using which is which was niobium. Um, since then, we don't disclose the metal anymore. Uh, but it is a, a superconducting loop, um, and the goal is to um, cool this um, down to uh, to uh, millikelvin level, and um, and uh, so that there is no resistance. It acts as a superconductor. Then now you can. Uh, uh, flow current in either uh, clockwise and anticlockwise direction. Um, so you can now, uh, and then you can encode logic, like logic zero could be clockwise flow of current, logic one could be and anticlockwise flow of current. So that's kind of the idea here. So you want to make these programmable. So uh, that's why they're coupled with a microwave resonator. So, uh, right, so you, you apply microwave. So whenever you write code, that will eventually Con compiled into microwave signals, that microwave signal uh, induces uh, changes in the flow of the current. You also want to apply logic gates, which means you want to couple two qubits uh, using a different type of microwave resonator so that you can apply a uh, logic gate in that resonator, which couples degrees of freedom of those two qubits. There is also a separate resonator to uh, read out the result of the computation. Um, and um, and as you can see, it could yes. Is there any question? Yeah, there is a question on the bridge. Uh, at what temperature is this operating? That's a great question. So I have uh, I, a little bit later, but I can um, I have those numbers a little bit later. But it is basically um, twenty millikelvin, which is um, colder than intergalactic space. Um, I used to uh, um, re remember the. A temperature of intergalactic space, but I don't remember it today. But yeah, let's <laughs> call it uh, hotter than this chip. Um, so this chip goes in a so as you ask the temperature, right? So that means that it uh, it uh, um, resides in inside a fridge, right? Those fridges are known as dilution refrigerators. So you are looking at um, uh, aluminum structure, uh, which houses that refrigerator and uh, just to give you the scale, uh, two of my colleagues actually on the right, uh, Sarah Sheldon, who is my second hand manager, on the left, Han Hee Pai. Um, so, so you can see that there are actually two to four people can actually stand within that structure, and they're they're holding, uh, they're basically working on this refrigerator. And if you squint your eyes a little bit, you can see that there are golden plates. Um, and um, those plates are gold plated plates and each plate indicates certain uh, temperature. So we basically bring them the temperature one plate at a time. Um, and where does the chip go? The chip goes right there. So at the very bottom of that refrigerator, we uh, put the chip, then we basically shield that uh, refrigerator, shield the structure, then we put more shielding around it. In most cases, these are like custom made museum grade glass so that people can see. Um, um, and um, so, yeah, so, so that's that's how it works. So since you asked, um, so uh, I also have a schematic of this fridge uh, or dilution refrigerator. As you can see, uh, each of these horizontal bar is basically is representing a, a gold plated disc. So you see the first one is four Kelvin. So which is basically liquid helium. Um, um, below that, now you have uh, uh, like two different isotopes of liquid helium and also nitrogen so to combine those. And you bring down them to 1800 millikelvin, then 100, then 15 millikelvin, and so on. So uh, uh, that's how we uh, bring down the temperature. Um, so 
in a, uh, so uh, once you put the packaging around it, it looks like this white cylinder. And in a quantum data center, you have multiple cylinder, right? And um, uh, so and they're all kind of um, connected in a way. On the right hand side, this is basically our vision of future supercomputer centric quantum data center. And at this moment, we are actually building a prototype of that uh, in our lab, uh, the, um, at the ground level. So if you, if you visit uh, right now, you will see there's a huge construction going on. We are basically building a prototype of this um, uh, schema we have on the right hand side. Um, on this right hand side, um, you see these uh, two uh, sphere. Those are known as block sphere in quantum mechanics is typically used to uh, visually describe the state of a quantum uh, uh, of a qubit. Here there are symbols of quantum uh, computer and they will be living in close proximity to a supercomputer or high performance computer and there will be a uh, hardware and middle layer which will orchestrate computation between classical and quantum computer. Um, I, I also like to use this, um, um, this schematic for two reasons. First of all, it gives you an end-to-end -end, um, um, workflow if some, a user or a customer uses a quantum computer. So let's say you are a customer. So you'll be sitting at the desk on the left, and that laptop is actually your laptop. And when you write, say, say you write a program in Python using our, our library, right? So that Python uh, uh, code goes into this middle rack, which is traditional data center rack with lots of custom uh, custom electronics. Uh, those electronics convert your code uh, into multiple level of uh, representation, intermediate representation, and eventually they generate microwave pulses. Those microwave pulses go uh, to uh, the fridge I have shown you before. And in that fridge, we basically apply those pulses to, uh, to our super, um, superconducting loops and induce changes in the flow of current. And you have to keep in mind that when you bring it down to 20, uh, around 20 millikelvin, they become superconductors. So they, they are no longer classical objects. They are quantum objects. Their, their behavior can be explained using only using principles of quantum mechanics, not using classical mechanics. So they are quantum objects. So, um, so which means that you could also have two uh, uh, two directions, clockwise and anticlockwise flow of currents, at the same time in superpositions. So you are already working in quantum regime when you cool it down. Um, so on this hardware. IBM uh, has already built a software stack. We call it QuizKit. That means Quantum Information Science Kit. And we already have uh, uh, multiple pillars of um, application layers. So one for uh, natural science simulation. Say if you have um, a chemistry problem, material science problem, maybe a nuclear physics problem, or high energy physics problem, you basically use our natural science stack. Um, if you have some kind of operations research problem, say optimization, uh, mixed media programming, or some other type of um, pro uh, similar problems, you, you use our operations research stack. And if you have machine learning problem, let's say you, you want to do some kind of classification problem or regression problem, or, or maybe some kind of quantum neural network, you use our quantum machine learning stack. So these are... Um, these are uh, while, while we uh, these uh, are available to the clients as a product. These are also active area of research. So, which means that you will, if you are using it, you will see that uh, these are evolving and maturing at a very fast pace. Um, IBM also uh, uh, has a publicly announced roadmap. So in our roadmap, um, so we have certain uh, targets within uh, uh, until 2025 uh, uh, and beyond that we have a general uh, vision of how we are going to make progress. And this roadmap can be understood at uh, hardware level, kernel, hardware kernel algorithm and model level. So at a hardware level, 
uh, so you could see that uh, we have like two rows of roadmap, right? The main, the longer row, which is basically what we're saying is that we will keep uh, um, uh, increasing the number of qubit in our hardware. So, um, so why we need to increase them? You could, you could uh, think qubit uh, as the quantum unit of quantum information, just like bit in classical computing. So of course, more qubit means more memory. So more memory means you can encode larger and larger instance of the same problem. So it is natural that you want to have more qubit to uh, um, solve bigger problems. But when we, uh, but number of qubit is actually only one aspect of performance metric or capability metric. So at the, um, uh, I, 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 I mentioned before, right? These are quantum system. So these are very sensitive. So every quantum system um, comes, uh, when it, it is operational, it comes with a lifetime. And this lifetime is uh, in the order of, for our, for our system, this is in the order of um, my, um, microsecond to close to millisecond. So which means that um, you, whatever computation you want to do, you have to finish it within that time because beyond that uh, time point, it will start interacting with the environment and uh, that will corrupt the information. So whatever you get after that point is basically garbage. So how come you can do useful computation um, within that time period? I think that's a natural question. Um, there are actually interesting computation you can uh, do within that time frame. That's one uh, um, aspect. And another aspect is that um, if you have error correcting code, and if you're able to fix the error faster than the rate error itself is accumulating, you can actually do a compute, uh, um, uh, computation for uh, infinitely long time. You just keep fixing them. And we have analogy in classical computing because we use error correcting code in classical computing. So there are error correcting code exists for quantum computers and that allows us to go beyond our, its natural physical limit of information storage. Uh, physical limit in time, uh, along like temporal limit. Um, there is another thing um, which is um, the gate, yes. Sorry, there are uh, were a couple of questions. Uh, yeah. One was from actually earlier slides. How much electron volts per degree of freedom? That was a question, uh, follow up question about the temperature. Uh, and the other one is what's the power consumption of Osprey? Um, great, great question and also hard question for a theorist. <laughs> um, uh, on, on, Honestly, I do not know um, uh, about the electron volt um, for for those superconducting loops. I, uh, but I'm happy to um, um, I'm, uh, I'm happy to um, uh, point you to the right resources after the talk. Uh, definitely, um, um, uh, which are developed basically research papers by our, our hardware team and also like standard uh, resources in the community. And the second question was the power consumption of Osprey. You said, right? Yeah, yes. Um, I don't think uh, we disclose that anymore. I have to check, but uh, I can point to resources, which uh, like academic resources where they uh, 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 discuss about power consumption of similar uh, type of superconducting qubit chips. There are also dedicated conferences uh, on power consumption of quantum hardware. So I'm happy to point to those resources too after the talk. Is, would that be okay? Yeah, I think that would be. An yeah, I, I, know, I know. I know. I know. Yeah. I didn't uh, answer to those questions, but I'm pretty much sure that some of these things um, our hardware team would like to uh, keep under the rug. And I'm basically not clear to discuss at this point. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, another question from Aisha uh, is 99% uh, logic accuracy included in the error you mentioned. Um, so, uh, where did you get this 99% number? Um, 
I shall, if you, uh, you, you can unmute yourself and ask it uh, in the presentation somewhere. Yes, it was in the presentation. I just saw that. Oh, I, um, I, I think uh, probably this one. Okay. Yes, okay. probably there. Yeah. All it right. Says yeah. ninety nine point four percent here, for example. Yes. For the okay. um, we're using. All right. Sure. Um, so first of all, this is a little bit old. Um, um, so when I when we say ninety nine percent, let me explain what it means. So um, just like just like classical computing, in quantum computing, when we express um, like any computation, we use a universal gate set. That universal gate set contains single qubit gate and two qubit gates. So for example, in classical computing, single single bit gates are like not gate. Two, two bit gate could be NAND gate, for example. So in quantum computing, when you apply two qubit gate, it comes with sources of error. Um, so what are the sources? First of all, you have this fundamental limit, uncertainty comes from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. That's unique to quantum computing. And uh, so, which means that uh, there will always be some, uh, some amount of uncertainty, which is fundamental limit. But beyond that, just because you are engineering these systems or hardware, um, there will be some uh, like um, error in manufacturing this uh, uh, this uh, in, in the manufacturing process. So, for example, um, you see on on my left hand side. For trapdown system, there is actually a paper from 2015 by Lumin Duan from Michigan, who actually kind of cataloged all the sources of errors when you develop uh, make uh, make a two qubit chip using a trapdown system using ITER, uh, using ITER BM 171 isotope. He cataloged like um, I believe about 40 different sources like laser power, laser fluctuation maybe some other type of readout error, all these things. You, for any of this system, you can catalog all these sources of errors. Your goal is to limit the total contribution of those sources in error to say 1% or 0.5%. So in our, I believe in our hardware, it is close to 99.8%, which basically means that uh, for our case, the two qubit gate is going to be um, cross resonance gate, or there are some other gates too, uh, you can use uh, cross resonance gates to uh, create some other high level logical gate. If you apply it, like say a thousand times, you will see error like, um, I don't know, maybe six times or for 99.4%, it will be for six times, you actually have to throw away the result and run it again. And um, so, and this error accumulates. So basically the the easiest way to think about is that, let's say you, you have a, a computation which has uh, a sequence of 1,000 two qubit gate. So your uh, error in the hardware should be at most one over 1,000, so that you can get meaningful outcome from your computation. Does it uh, it does it help, Aisa? Yes, uh, but I have a lot of questions. Let's listen in. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, um, I can also. Um, I mean, uh, maybe towards the end of the talk, we can also get back to the, some of these questions. Um, so yeah, um, going back um, to uh, yeah, so so here what I was talking about, I was talking about the hardware layer. So when we talk about hardware, most of the time in the press, you will see the journalists are referring to a qubit number. It's actually one of the multiple metrics. So yes, you need more qubits. You also need higher quality gates, right? So uh, right now we have, I'd say, right, 99.8% or something. That's our gate uh, accuracy. We want we want to add more and more nines to it, right? And we have a rough estimate that estimate that if we can add like five nines, we can easily do error correction. So means after when you have five nines, you can actually uh, um, uh, uh, run uh, as long computation you want. You do, you are not no longer limited within your decoherence time, which is basically in the order of microseconds. One other component is, um, we, we call it uh, CLOPS, basically circuit layer operations per second, which is kind of the quantum analog of FLOPS in classical computing. So because because there are, there are two reasons why we uh, oh, it is important. One is 
quantum computing is probabilistic. It comes from Schrodinger's wave equation. So which means that whatever you want to do, you have to do it like hundreds and thousands of times. You work on the probability distribution of the outcome. So which and so if you want to do meaningful computation, you have to run the circuit really fast. So that's the circuit layer operations per second. You want to have it as high as, as, high as possible. There's another element is that lots of uh, near-term quantum algorithms are basically a quantum circuit wrapped by a classical variational optimizer. So, so which means that you have to run the circuit many times with different parameterization. So each while you want to have each execution of circuit with many shots as fast as possible, we also want to uh, run this circuit with different parameters uh, as uh, as fast as possible. So that's why it is important that we have fast chips. So these are, so you have a number of qubit, quality of gate, and speed of circuit execution. And and if you ca cannot make progress in all three direction, you cannot do anything useful. And you can also see that in our roadmap, starting from next year, you will see that we are going to have multi-core chip. So here, uh, these cores are going to be connected using, first of all, um, um, like a very local quantum connection. Here, quantum connection means that quantum entanglement is spread over cores. We'll, we are also working on non-local connection, like 3D connection. We're also uh, 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 working on classical connection. So here it means that we will run a quantum algorithm, uh, measure it quickly into classical bit string, very quickly shuttle that information to a different chip, do computation there and going back and forth. So the, there are three types of co connection that will take place among all these cores. And we're, we're starting, we are already working on them and uh, 20, in 24, we will focus uh, on them like very uh, in a um, extensive manner, which also means that the model of computation will change. So uh, you will start thinking about threading. You will start thinking about uh, classical com uh, inform uh, communication. You will start thinking about quantum com uh, communication. So we are al we already have started adding those primitives into our programming language. Um, on the uh, on the higher level, uh, we are developing kernels um, like which can handle error correction, which can handle error mitigation, which can do dynamic circuit. Here, dynamic circuit means as you keep computing, you um, you keep measuring some part of the information, convert it into classical bit, bit string, and use that information to modify the rest of the circuit, things like this. So these are um, very um, difficult engineering challenges, and we are, we are making lots of progress there. And um, at the algorithm level, as I mentioned, we have these different pillars. We are adding lots of um, um, or libraries for like um, either doing some kind of divide and conquer operation or um, adding some pre-built circuit. Uh, these kernels are uh, being added. And of course, we are having uh, application pillars on top of those kernels. So just wanted to give you an idea of how we vision our future progress in this field. Um, at, uh, but while we are making progress, you can actually use quantum computers as of today. So this snapshot is from a um, couple of weeks ago. So this is pretty recent. Um, each uh, rectangle is one quantum computer. So you see that our computers are named after uh, regions or towns or cities, and maybe some of uh, all the cities might look familiar to you. Um, there are lots of metrics, um, different uh, system is using different generation of chip. We have those information. I don't want to go into details, but I want to highlight this, um, the numbers in larger form. So let's let's talk about the top left. So you see that number of qubit 127, QV 64 and clubs 850. So now you see that we are reporting three um, metrics, performance metric qubit. So how big the memory is, Quantum volume is the measure of the quality of the gate. So quantum, the larger the quantum volume is, the higher quality the gate is. And CLOPS is basically circuit layer operations per second, how fast the chip is. Uh, if you're curious why we have these barred pictures of bars, barred, 
uh, generation of chip. Um, so, yeah, so uh, right now we have all these systems available and some of them, those systems are actually available for free. So feel free to check them out and play with them. By the way, if you're quantum curious, IBM has quantum computing textbook or Quisky textbook, which is also free uh, for the community. Um, I would also like, like to um, uh, uh, like sh uh, give shout out to other technologies, which are not IBM pro uh, efforts, but there are other technologies. So for example, IonQ, which actually my previous uh, group, uh, they're developing um, uh, trapped and based quantum systems. Intel is using um, uh, um, um, silicon-based quantum dot, and there are other organizations using nitrogen vacancy uh, uh, in diamond, uh, the, uh, that uh, diamond-based chip where they have nitrogen vacancies. Um, I will now uh, switch to quantum, uh, like uh, uh, um, from hardware to algorithms, like what quantum, a little bit about quantum algorithms, but before that, is there is there any question? I have another question. Yes. You mentioned that there are some site uh, uh, calculations that could be done or experiments that are performed. Uh, you mentioned there is some local and then non-local uh, interaction between the subsections, so to speak, with the large sections of the qubits. So this is pretty, doesn't it? I, I'm not certain how and when exactly you introduce the new uh, outcomes or the results into the next section, but don't you have some timing requirements for this? Otherwise, your probability distributions will be affected, things will be different, or you could make even bigger errors. Are, are you referring to I'm like talking about your flamingo and above. You uh, mentioned that okay. there are some uh, connections that you have, local and non local connections. Yes. That, yes. So, what are the requirements? What are the, can you give us some view of how this happens? Because to me, in the middle of the many, many calculations, something else comes in that would create a bias. <laughs> maybe that's what you want, but maybe not. So, so are, are you referring to like, for example, calibration drift or something like that? Uh, I'm, let's say that a calculation is made in one subsection and then that data is transferred to the next section. Yes. And there must be some time frame where this happens yes. otherwise it would create some collusion or create some additional difficulties Correct. is there some sort of a, like a buffer how do you handle that data exchange that's a great question um so um at, at, at a theoretical level um so basically if you want to let's say you have two chips they are connected using a local quantum connection so what is the quantum connection here? So if you have um, two chips, either you can have um, like, uh, they, they, uh, let's say the, let's, say the let, let's just use this term, left chip and right chip. So the, the, there must be two qubits, which are very, the closest one on either, one in, uh, on either chip. So you can imagine a coaxial cable or a micro microwave cable connecting the uh, the two qubits, which are in closest physical proximity in between the two chips, right? Now, if you are doing a, let's say you're applying a quantum logic gate um, that involves these two qubits. So, of course, you have to design a pulse, microwave pulse, and you have to apply it to the resonator that connects these two chips. So that's an instantaneous operation. Now, however, let's say there is a local operation that took place in the left chip, and you want to move the outcome of that operation to the right chip. That will require us to apply multiple, a, a sequence of swap gate, which is a quantum logic gate. Um, and it, it involves two qubits. So we have to apply a chain of swap gate to move that information from one chip to another. And it might involve multiple clock speed, uh, 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 more than one clock step. And 
if we want to do subsequent computing on the other chip, on, on that computation, yes, we have to synchronize that data transfer with the next uh, operation on the second chip so that um, we are not um, corrupting uh, the coherence of the computation. Um, so yes, we have to maintain uh, synchronization. We have to synchronize the clock speed. We have to align uh, the computations temporarily, and we have to make sure that um, uh, we, we, when we move this, we don't all, we not only move the computation. It also comes with this uncertainty with each logic gate, and we have to make sure that we are mitigating the, that logic in the right way. Does that answer? Yes, it does, and it's very complicated. That's what it looks like. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, um, it is actually. So we have dedicated team who are working on noise mitigation of these kind of connections. Uh, other teams actually developing the connections in the hardware. There are uh, a big team which are theoretical physicists or computational physicists. They are developing the theoretical model, which is basically a open quantum Hamiltonian uh, for this. People in our team who are focused more on algorithms and theories. So we are developing the theoretical model of this computation. Uh, let's, so when you, let's say, I, I, I very casually mentioned that there could be multi-threaded computing, but what it, what it means when you are running different threads, uh, which means when you're running, uh, solving two different Sorringer's equation in parallel, how they interact how you do the timing. We have to develop this theoretical model. That's the job of our team. We develop those model of computation and then we try to uh, align it with our hardware limitations. So yeah, these are very valid questions. Uh, yep, yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, right, um, um, uh, I, 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 I would take this opportunity to invite everyone to at least take advantage of the free systems uh, available in our uh, in our uh, cloud quantum cloud, and I also meant right uh, this. Oh, I wanted to give a shout out to uh, other companies who are also developing different types of um, quantum chips. I, I, I didn't mention Google and Amazon because they are also developing superconducting chips. So that kind of covered uh, 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 with the previous slides. Um, so in quantum algorithm, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is a colloquium talk. So I'm not going to like give you a walkthrough of a particular quantum algorithm, although I have that in the backup slide. But I would like to um, mention some of the algorithms um, just by names. And, um, and and there is a context why I'm going to mention those algorithms. It's not, I'm not choosing them based on their um, like theoretical uh, sophistication or their like um, importance uh, like scientific importance, I'm going to, uh, I selected these uh, algorithms based on their impact in um, industry funding, how they impact uh, the source of funding. So that's, that's and of course, this is my uh, uh, choice, uh, uh, preference, and I might have, there might be some interesting faces there. So I, I, I highlight these first three algorithms, which is basically the, in, Mid 80s, there are a bunch of couple, three papers by Feynman. Then, um, and then, then there is a 1994 work and 1996 work. These three, uh, uh, this body of work basically created the foundation of quantum computing. Um, so, uh, there are lots of very important work which I have not mentioned here. For example, um, between 1985 and 1994, there are a lot of works by um, by my teammate Charlie Bennett, um, who basically showed that you can use quantum computing, quantum mechanics, to define logical steps of computation. He first showed those for classical computing, so he basically showed how to define XOR gate, NAND gate, NOT gate, AND gate using quantum mechanics. Then he uh, showed how you can use quantum logical gate. So what I'm showing is, uh, for, uh, 19, uh, I skipped those, but I'm highlighting 1994. In 1994, Peter Shaw, who is a mathematician at MIT, 
he first sh sh uh, gave a quantum algorithm for prime factorization. So those who are involved, uh, who, who work in cryptography, you already know that the foundation of our public key cryptography, and um, and by that relation, the security of your bank account is based on this assumption, unproven assumption, that classical computers cannot be, cannot break, or, or cannot factor uh, large integers into its prime factors. They are not, that's not scalable. The best classical algorithm, which is general number field, see, is takes exponential amount of time. That's why your bank accounts are assumed to be secured against attack. There is no mathematical proof that they are, they are guaranteed to be secure. So what showed, the, showed is that it's actually a very easy problem for quantum computers. So which means that if there is a scalable quantum computer, um, uh, 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 which is fast enough, you can basically break public key encryption. But don't worry, I don't have one of those at my home right now. So your account is secure. Um, but we but we are that's what that's kind of um, uh, draw attention of lots of people back then. Everyone thought, okay, oh well, wait, wait a bit. You can actually use quantum computing to do something very important. Then in 1996, Love Grover at Bell Lab uh, showed another. Uh, 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 proposed another quantum algorithm and he uh, he proved that if you have a database and say there is no structure in that database and you're looking for an entry, the quantum algorithm is quadratically faster than the best classical algorithm. Um, if you re recall your um, undergrad data structure course, classical algorithm takes about big O of N time to find an entry quantum mechanics, quantum algorithm takes square root of n. So that's why it is quadratic speed up. So these three works basically uh, sh uh, showed that these two works, 1994-96 work, showed that, all right, uh, you can, you are not solving just exotic uh, um, mathematical uh, um, uh, um, operations. You are actually solving problems real, uh, which are related to real life. So that kind of created first quantum computing industry. It, brought, uh, it drew attention from um, government uh, funding agency for the first time. Then in 2005, there was a uh, paper by uh, Seth Lloyd at MIT and a few other people. They showed that you can actually solve, uh, simulate natural science problem uh, or chemis chemistry problems using a quantum computer. And uh, you, you might recall that that was the original intention of Feynman. He wanted to simulate quantum systems using a controlled quantum uh, system, another quantum controlled quantum system, which is a quantum computer. So now Seth Lloyd gave a proper algorithm with standard complexity theoretic analysis. So that was the 2005 work. So uh, this, and there was another work in 2015 from Google and also kind of parallel work from IBM, we showed that um, you can actually do some of those calculation with today's quantum computer, so which are actually very, very primitive. Even though these are very, very primitive, we can actually do something interesting with those. So that's kind of um, uh, um, cre uh, drew the attention of national labs who spend lots of money in um, uh, material science, um, nuclear, physics, chemistry, high energy physics. So they, they got very interested a bit, um, after these works were published. Finally, uh, along with Grover's paper, there was another paper in 2008, which showed that um, in certain settings, you can solve systems of linear equations using a quantum computer with exponential speed up. So that might actually uh, um, do, uh, you, some of you might be interested because lots, uh, if you're doing machine learning, lots of the time you are just solving some linear algebra problem. And in 20, 2014, 
There was another paper which basically showed that you can actually solve non-convex optimization problem um, uh, uh, use, um, using near-term quantum computer. So you got unstructured optimi a database search, which is basically in a, you can you can represent any hard optimization problem as unstructured database search, whether the entry is the global minima. Now you have another problem where you solve you're solving you're doing linear algebra, and you're also and in 2014 you can it is shown that you can do something interesting within uh, existing technology. That drew the attention of Silicon Valley, like uh, Amazon, Google, and um, few other companies started investing uh, into this system because there was a, they thought, okay, quantum computing do something beyond just chemistry or physics. So the, the, these three kind of batches of work drew major waves of quantum computing uh, funding. So that's why I wanted to mention this. And finally, um, in 23, there was a paper from our group which uh, went into onto, on the cover of uh, Nature. So they, this is the first time there was a computation done on a quantum computer, which is not like a contrived example. It is solving certain condensed matter physics problem, and you cannot really simulate that result using a classical computer or even a, the best supercomputer. So we call the we name this as utility scale quantum computing, which means that we're not claiming that we are already have quantum advantage, but we have we are seeing some results for a real problem uh, that cannot be simulated using a classical computer. So this is this is beyond just curiosity. We are actually solving actual science, and it is not trackable with your best supercomputer. So we are we say that this is these are we are we entering the phase re, uh, era of utility scale quantum computing where. Um, you need to do real science to understand what is going on. Um, so that kind of um, gives you uh, like a chr chronology of different waves of interest and funding in quantum computing. Um, so now I, since we are still, uh, we I said uh, I'll, I'm going to talk about algorithms. I want to talk about like how we choose problems when we develop quantum algorithms how we choose problems, how we target those problems. I will first talk at a general level, then I will give you some idea of how we think about machine learning problems. Um, let me check, uh, I hope I'm doing good on time. Um, okay, yeah. So, so I'm, 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 I'm a complexity theorist by training, so I, I kind of um, use the tools I know, and these are basically theoretical or vis visual tools. So if you, if you ask any uh, complexity theorist or any theoretical computer scientist about like any problem, they always have this picture in uh, back, back of their mind. So this is basically families of problem. Each shape is a family of problem. And these, the two, the two shapes are different based on their hardness. So for example, the circle P is basically the easiest problem um, you can imagine. And for each of these families, I have an example what, what problem you can imagine. So for example, P means, uh, so you know Turing machine, right? The uh, uh, mathematical model of classical computing. So if you have, uh, if you want to solve uh, if you want to determine whether a number is prime, you can actually do it uh, polynomially using a, a Turing machine. So that's called P. Um, so these are easy problems. Um, if you want to solve traveling salesman, basically that's what UPS, FedEx, uh, or USPS do every day, right? They're trying to optimize their route, uh, delivering parcels. That's actually a hard, very hard problem. That's in NP complete, which means that you need uh, you need a non-deterministic. Uh, uh, if you have uh, if you have this problem, you cannot really solve that in polynomial time. However, if someone gives you 
uh, a solution to the problem, you can verify it using a non-deterministic Turing machine in polynomial time. So all these shapes in gray, they are basically different levels of hierarchy in uh, classical computing, a uh, 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 hierarchy of pr problem families. The two colored shapes are uh, contribution from quantum computing. Uh, because quantum computing uh, has different types, hierarchy of capability, the, their shapes are different and sometimes they contain certain classical problems, sometimes they do not. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to integer factoring, which is uh, which belongs to BQP. So BQP is basically when problems are easy for quantum computers. QMA is when problems are hard for quantum computers. So whenever you give me a problem, I will s and try ask me to solve it using a quantum computer. If it is in BQP, I will say that yes, it is easy. If it is in QMA, I said no, it is not easy for quantum computer. So so this is how, and we have this in mind when we look for problems um, uh, uh, which can be solved on a quantum computer. And hopefully there will be some speed up or advantage uh, compared to state of the art classical um, alternative. So, and, and the, our target problems are basically uh, showed by this red outline. I don't want, I'm not trying to solve anything in QMA, right? because it will be hard for quantum computers too. I want to solve problems which are easy for quantum computers and um, hard for classical computers. That's why I'm staying outside of P. And you could see that I'm going little beyond BQP and close to NP because I want some, maybe sometimes I want to, I, can, I will not be able to solve exactly using a quantum computer, but I will approximate the result. So that's why I have this little protrusion beyond BQP. Um, so, so what, what, what this selection of problem looks like? Um, so since this audience um, is um, an IEEE um, um, group, uh, I'm talking about quantum machine learning. I'm not a machine learning person, so um, um, yeah, um, hopefully I will not say anything stupid. But I, I typically, the, uh, for this part of my talk, I typically, uh, choose the area based on the audience. So if I'm speaking in front of the physics community, I will probably choose a nuclear physics problem. If it is a, chemi a chemist, a group of chemists, I will probably choose some kind of chemistry or material science problems. Um, so for machine learning problems, what we think that um, quantum computing will be, will have higher chance of success if we choose problems from the long tail of AI. So what it means. So when you create a machine learning model, it performs really well for a, um, for a set of problems or for a set of data sets and a given problem. And um, there is always a distribution of problems where, um, your model is not performing well. Uh, and in, in AI, typically that distribution is a long tail. Um, in the fat head, which is the part where your, your model is performing really well, that's where you're making money as a classical computer scientist. If we try to solve problem there, I don't think we can actually compete with you. Um, so, so that's why um, our goal is to focus on this part. This is actually, I don't think this is actually culturally accepted as a, uh, in the community, like quantum computing community. Uh, at IBM, I'm also responsible for developing a long-term road, developing and maintaining a long-time roadmap for quantum machine learning. So this is how I think, and I'm trying to popularize it within my group, um, and also within the broad quantum machine learning community. Um, yeah, I also talk about this in um, conferences or workshops. That's that's where I believe um, we will be able to make money, basically. Um, 
by the way, this long tail doesn't just come from a scale. So let's say, let's say you have a machine learning problem. It could be, it could be a classification problem. It doesn't have to be always generative AI. Um, we will not automatically find a problem which is easy for quantum computing and hard for classical computing if we just scale up the problem. Uh, the, um, the hardness comes from a combination of a scale and a structure. So um, it is, there is this um, um, theorem in classical or theoretical computer science called threshold theorem. So basically, if I go back to uh, this part, you see the NP, the, the family of NP problem, this big circle. Uh, uh, anytime you, as a, computer, a classical computer scientist, you're making money, you're probably solving something in that family, good enough, not exactly. And that's good enough for you to get paid. That's probably happening. So for any class of NP problem, NP or uh, NP problem, um, there is always a threshold, um, and this threshold can be measured in terms of any ensemble, uh, some kind of ensemble parameter or a structure parameter, which basically encodes some structure element of the problem instance. So we, uh, there, there is a theorem which says that that we you can always identify a threshold, and before that threshold, the problems the instances from that family are hard, easy, and beyond the threshold, instances of that problem family are hard. So think about a satisfiability problem or a classification problem. So a whole family of classification problem, and say you randomly choose thousand instances of classification problem or thousand instances of satisfiability problem. Um, if you can identify a useful parameter, you will see that there is a transition of computational hardness. We say that this is a phase transition of computational hardness, and there is a easy to hard transition. So that's what. Uh, um, so so. Uh, so when we say that we want to work on long tail of AI, that will come from scale, a combination of a scale and a structure, and that structure will give us take us to a place where we are talk, working on the hard problem. We are able to identify the transition and we know where the hard problem lies and we are uh, solving the hard problems um, in a, uh, using a quantum computer. So hard problems means they are hard at the scale for classical computing. So it's not just a scale problem. Maybe there is some structure which is making them hard. And actually, we sometimes we know the why those are hard. So for uh, right now, I'm wrapping up a paper with a few other researchers. We are identifying those structures that they're, they're causing the hardness for protein conformation prediction. So you have alpha fold, amazing result. We are talking about the structures which basically um, um, puts alpha fold into trouble and you cannot really solve them at scale. And so, for example, there are actually these examples for uh, uh, the examples I have here are computer vision problem. There are papers which talk about long tail of computer vision problem where your model is no longer performing good enough. So now basically you can do nothing or try quantum. That's what we focus on. So um, our hope is that we'll be able to do something clever or unique with quantum computer so that someone will be, will be paying for that service. By the way, one other thing I have to mention that when we say that we are focusing on uh, that long tail and we are trying to Im create impact there, add value there, we have to keep in mind as a quantum computer scientist that this long, uh, 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 sorry, our focus is actually a sliding window on that long tail. Because as we keep perfecting our technology, the classical computing will keep improving. So every time the, a new technology shows up in classical computing, that will capture more of that long tail. But we have reasons to believe that uh, we will always be solving a smaller slice of a bigger pie. 
So there will always be a long tail for us uh, so that we can make money. So I can give you some more uh, specific example in different areas of machine learning. But before that, uh, I would like to put that discussion into context. As, and I kind of already alluded to that discussion. So when we talk about quantum, using quantum computers uh, for machine learning problems, we have to be very humble about it. So we, we, we are basically uh, um, um, competing against H100, right? NVIDIA chips, which are basically gigahertz chips and the best quantum chip is runs at kilohertz. So, I uh, I mean, you could argue that well, IBM has very uh, like very advanced CMOS technology. Why cannot you just uh, make chips which can run in gigahertz? That's our goal, but we are not there yet. So, if we want to create um, impact today, we are basically competing uh, bid. Uh, uh, competing against uh, chips which are orders of magnitude faster than us, so we have to keep, uh, we have to be humble about that. And then memory capacity, right? Uh, classical machine learning models are using trillion parameters, and uh, our best computer probably has hundred plus qubits. Like they are not even comparable. And then the third one is that um, classical computers will have more and uh, uh, will have uh, um, higher, uh, higher and higher level operations as native operation, native instruction. So which means that those operations will become cheaper and cheaper every year. So whenever we say we are trying to add value with quantum computing, this is what we are against. And somehow we have to add value while we, our classical computers are doing so many amazing things. And, and we believe that in some cases we actually can do that today. That's why we are saying that in 2023, 2023, we are entering the utility scale era of quantum computing. Um, by the way, um, as I mentioned by this sliding window, a good way to think what will happen in classical computing during uh, the development of quantum computing is basically, uh, is a paper by Jack Donagora who got Turing Award a couple of, I think last year, and few other people from Oak Ridge. So the bit, the, I mean, you don't, uh, I mean, uh, uh, so what, what, I mean, if you want to take a, like one sentence summary um, of what uh, they say, this bit, bit, they say that we are entering the bespoke high performance computing era, which means that every area of application will have its bespoke HPC chip. And that is going to create surprise classical computing surprises in our quantum computing road advances. And that surprises might be just a better GPU, beautiful semiconductor, um, like surprises from our my, my own colleagues in IBM, uh, maybe some photonic technology that might show up, who knows? And we have to, so when we select problems, we have to keep the, these sur future surprises in mind and still we'll have to try to create impact. And I can give you some example how we are doing that. So when we think about machine learning, it could be anything, right? It could be learning theory, um, which is basically the theoretical model of machine learning. It could be uh, feature selection problems, it could be classification problems, generative models. I'm not going to give you an uh, uh, example of every box, but internally when, I, when I'm working on our roadmap, we have to go through every box and we have to make sense of why we chose a problem for a certain box. Um, let, let me give you an example of, let's say, classification and clustering problem. So there, so uh, let me give you how we think about these problems. So at a theoretical level, uh, we are trying to develop new algorithm, quantum algorithms, um, which gives you quantum speed up for classification problem. Let's say you have quant you have support vector machine. There are, is actually quantum support vector machine. So why do we think that someone should care about quantum support vector machine? So 
we have ongoing research program which is working on uh, defining kernel functions encoded in Hilbert space because that is the natural language of quantum uh, mechanics. And we are uh, trying to understand uh, the information geometry of this Hilbert, which is basically Fisher matrix, Riemannian geometry, and things like that. And we are trying to show that um, if you encode information in a Hilbert space, the separation of your labels in the data set could be higher than a classical alternative. And there is a fundamental reason why that will always be better or bigger separation. So that, which means that not the scale, but the structure of the data set is allowing us to show some speed up, which, will, which classical computing will never achieve. We have one example of those, now we are trying to expand it for generic uh, practical data set. That's an ongoing research program. So just wanted to give you an example. If you think about collaboration with our uh, research partners, so for example, we have ongoing collaboration with Cleveland Clinic where they want to bring quantum classification algorithms for their practical data set. So we kind of have an arbitrary filter that Whenever someone says that I'm stuck with classification accuracy below 70%, we said, okay, we are interested. When someone says that, yeah, our accuracy is somewhere between 85 to 90%, we said, no, we are not going to work on that. Um, so we arbitrarily chose a problem for which the best researchers with their best techniques are stuck at around 70% prediction accuracy. We said that maybe there is something uh, interesting at a structure level. Let's try to understand better. So just to give you an example, how we think about them, how we select problems for a specific example. And and you can think um, and that model can be applied for any other boxes here. Um, uh, is there any question? Um, I will, I, I'm going to now switch from like problem selection to um, the, what are the concerns when we actually build our hardware? Uh, Dr. Shia, I'll do a time check. So yeah, we are uh, running a bit over time, but okay. I mean, if you, it's okay on your side, then yeah, feel free to continue. And okay. same for the participants. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I'm also um, very close to, and uh, so I will uh, quickly wrap up. So, um, so, so we kind of, um, so uh, we already uh, kind of discussed like the fundamentals of, of, of quantum computing principles. We had a visual tour of how these devices look like. Um, we also talked about um, how, uh, how we think about quantum advantage, how we select problems for that. We also had like a historical tour of important quantum algorithms and uh, what was the context of their, uh, why we thought there's a, how, what impact they created, right? Now I'll quickly uh, give you an idea about like, w w what are the challenges we are facing today at IPM? Um, so first of all, building these systems are very hard. They, we are solving both scientific and engineering problems. So if you think about the requirements, you want to protect your quantum system from the environmental noise, you have to shield those systems. But at the same time, you have to uh, develop a very precise control mechanism to, so that you can program the system. So these two are conflicting requirements. You want to shield them, but at the same time, you want to have very precise uh, control. So when you have a system where the requirements are conflicting, it becomes hard to design, hard to manufacture. So, so that's why it is very challenging. Um, so, 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 but there, yeah, that's what we are trying to achieve. Um, um, so, g let me give you like the scale of error, um, and and put it in the context of errors in classical computing. So, in GPUs, uh, this is a little bit old. I'm sure they are getting better, but roughly, if you are if you are running a compute compute for like for hours, like. Uh, like dozens of hours, or uh, then you start seeing some error because of 
uh, cosmic cosmic ray, right? In quantum computing, you don't have to go that level. Yes, there are implications of cosmic rays, but you the very fundamental theory of quantum mechanics itself is the source of uncertainty, Heisenberg's limit. On top of that, you have uh, uncertainty because the physical model we have, the Hamiltonian we have, is an approximation of the actual system. So our Hamiltonian is not complete, is not perfect. So, which means that we don't know all the sources of models. On top of that, the engineering design itself has its own imperfections. So all these things contributes to noise in the gate. And each individual's physics, uh, physical logic gate comes with error or uncertainty. So just to want to give you a comparative um, understanding. Um, so, so this is why building the systems is very challenging. And that's why they're also exciting. Um, um, there is never a dull day uh, in quantum computing. And also there is always some for little, to some extent firefighting. Uh, anytime there is a progress and thanks to uh, lots of you, uh, we, we are scared, okay, did they just um, uh, uh, bit an existing quantum algorithm with a better classical algorithm? Who knows, it happened multiple times. Um, so, so natural question is, um, uh, some of you might be thinking like, how much of quantum com uh, classical computing will be replaced by quantum computing? So we think that we are not going to replace classical computing, we'll augment classical computing. So most of the time, um, we will, apart from doing traditional classical computing, we will also do, uh, we will also uh, solve some additional uh, problems using a quantum computer. And quantum computer and classical computers will talk to each other uh, very fast and very frequently. So this scheduler is basically, I imagine this as a very rich custom-made um, uh, uh, electronics which will very fast uh, take a look at the structure of the problem and guess the hardness of the problem without actually solving it and quickly decide whether to send it to a quantum computer or a classical computer. So I can imagine like five years, 10 years from now, hundreds of electrical engineers are thinking uh, about developing the most sophisticated middle layer FPGA or some some custom electronics, which basically do all this orchestration uh, at say exaflop speed. So this is this that this is all I had uh, for today. I will quickly kind of summarize some of the takeaways. First of all, quantum computing is not a silver bullet for all hard problems. There will always be hard problems quantum computing is kind of solve. We, we already know it at a theoretical level. Also, I want to uh, uh, some, um, mention that uh, the, some of the primitives of quantum computing comes from the principles of uh, uh, quantum mechanics. So that's why there is no classical analog. And that not only changes the hardware, it also changes the model of computation and programming. And I would also like to uh, highlight that there is these two division. One is error corrected or fault tolerant quantum. There are like two regimes of quantum computing. One is error corrected or fault tolerant quantum computing, which is the holy grail. We are not there yet. We are working on that. And there is this utility scale quantum computing, which is what we are we can do today. Uh, and both are scientifically in, interesting. And I would also mention that you can use. Uh, IBM's Python-based software kit, QuizKit, to use quantum computers and IBM Cloud today for free. Not all, but some. So uh, you guys are more than welcome to uh, take advantage of these amazing resources. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shea. I, that was a very interesting and wonderful uh, talk. Uh, and uh, to the audience, if you have any question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask.
Are there any security concerns with using a quantum computer? So today we spend a lot of time and money and effort setting up security. Uh, does a quantum computer have any notion of what that is, or do you just assume a proxy of the classical computer provides the security that you need and there's no security in the quantum side? That's a great question. Um, so there is a whole field of quantum cryptography, which I have not covered at all. Um, so as soon as um, uh, Peter Shor invented uh, his uh, Shor cell rhythm, everyone in cryptography started paying attention, right? Because now we know that, uh, for example, RSA cryptography or elliptic curve cryptographies are no longer secure against a quantum computer, right? We already know that. Um, so that's why NIST, so National Institute of Science and Technology, started a program a few years ago, which is called Post Quantum Cryptography. And under that uh, uh, program, they have uh, they basically gave funding uh, to different organizations to come up to propose new cryptographic protocol, so which are quantum resistant. So these are known as post quantum uh, quantum safe or post quantum. Uh, cryptographic protocols. So I'm excited to uh, let you know that very recently, NIST uh, announced uh, four uh, draft pro uh, protocol, cryptographic protocols, uh, as like candidates first for first round, and three of them were invented at IBM. Um, so it's it's a it's a uh, huge research program on its own merit. Uh, uh, quantum safe cryptography. Uh, apart from that, the the field of quantum cryptography is different. So there are cryptographic protocol, for example, BB84, which is basically um, Bennett, so Char Charlie Bennett in uh, my team, and uh, uh, Giles Brassard. They in 1984 they gave this BB84 protocol, the first quantum cryptographic protocol for uh, um, quantum key distribution. And then there are uh, actually uh, that kind of started this field of quantum cryptography. And there are hundreds of quantum cryptographic protocols. Not only that, there are quant commercial product available as of today in the market, which allows you to use quantum pre-distribution. There are banks who actually use them. And IBM also has commercial product for quantum safe crypto, uh, uh, cryptography. So there are commercial, in, uh, quantum cryptography is actually commercially more mature than quantum computing. There are co commercial products for that. And then how, how do you see the scaling up of the number of qubits? You know, if you're using, a, if you, you talked about how you're interconnecting uh, locally and non-locally, say all these different quantum processors, uh, what what is the, ultimate goal, you know, I've seen numbers of a million qubit, but that some people think it should be, there should be no limit, but practically speaking, is there a known limit to how large number of qubits uh, you can get one of these machines to be using? That's a great question. So, um, so, 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 so first of all, uh, the question you ask is actually still an open question. So, um, at the very beginning, uh, it was mentioned that one of my pro research projects is funded by DARPA. That project is called Quantum Benchmarking Project. Basically, what DARPA wants to know is what are, what are the smallest interesting problems in different fields? And it is still unknown uh, what is the smallest interesting problem for each of the field. The, the only problem for which we have concrete resource count is basically a RSA uh, breaking of RSA public key cryptography. If you want to break, I believe it is uh, uh, 2048 bit cryptography, you need about 20 million qubit uh, for a bunch of assumptions. Basically, for a certain type of error correcting code, for a certain type of technology, it will be 20 qubit, uh, 20 million qubit. So, um, and we have 100 plus qubits in IBM. So we are order of magnitude behind what we need to break source uh, public key cryptography at production grade. So, 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 so that's kind of, the, so that, so the number you have, the million number you have is basically because of that uh, paper. Um, but 
uh, we believe that uh, that's actually, that number will go down drastically very soon because uh, there are several assumptions I mentioned. One of the assumption for that number is that we are going to use surface code, quantum surface code as the error correcting code, uh, underlying error correcting code. But at IBM, we are developing way more efficient code, which, which are orders of magnitude more efficient than surface code. And uh, so obviously that will bring down the qubit requirement for source algorithm. And it will also bring out the resource, resource requirement for other algorithm, which might need fewer qubits anyway. So there you go. So, so basically, um, I don't think I gave you a, an exact number, but I'm trying to like show you like what is the right way of thinking here. Thank you. By the way, these are all amazing questions. Thank you for that. Any more question? Uh, if not, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shehab. It was uh, a pleasure also seeing you after meeting you after a while. And uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. I think uh, everyone really liked it in the chat. Uh, everybody. Uh, really are saying great things about this talk. So uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining uh, us in this talk. Uh, yeah, have a good night. Thank you everyone. Good yeah. night. Bye. Bye. Bye.